Good morning. Good, morning. Good, to, good to have uh, members and friends of St. Paul's here worshiping this, this morning, also saying good morning to, to the radio folks. I always forget about those folks uh, listening to, to God's word on the radio. Good to, good to be together with you all. We're at the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. And if you're going to be looking for a connecting thread, uh, a message throughout our service this morning, it's, it's this aspect of, of God sending out messengers that, that too often I fall into this trap of saying, well, those messengers, those missionaries that go out, well, it's the pastors that do that. Well, it's those missionaries that go to Japan and Russia, those kinds of guys that do that. But when Jesus gave the Great Commission to go out and teach all nations, he gave it to all of us. And so look for that thread of the powerful word of God uh, being shared by Christians, shared by the Christian church uh, in our hymns, in our readings, etc. So let's get started with our worship. Everything, I have to warn you, some of you may have copies. Uh, our, our photocopier was having issues last week that there's a few copies that, that didn't print very well towards the top of the pages. So if you're one of those that has a, a, a service folder that didn't print too well, just make sure you, you change your focus up to the screen and follow along. Shouldn't, shouldn't uh, throw you off too much, but just, just keep that in mind. So let's get, let's get started with our worship this morning. Let's sing our first hymn, hymn 568.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your one and only Son as the word of life for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us believe what the scriptures proclaim about him and lead us to live and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In this story of Isaiah's call to ministry, there are a few things we need to make note of. First, Isaiah was not worthy for this call. No one is. Only through God's power and forgiveness can anyone be qualified to minister to God's people and in his name. 
And then finally, God's grace can't help but change us and motivate us to serve our Savior. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now with our psalm of the day. That's Psalm 67. You can find that printed on page 6 in your service folder. Let's speak those verses responsively. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let's continue now with our praise choir song, Here I Am, Lord.
Our second lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 12 through 17. This passage tells us about God's plan for bringing salvation to his people. This salvation is for Jew and Gentile alike, and it comes to us only through the preaching of the gospel. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Our verse of the day for today comes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Alleluia. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Alleluia. Please stand. And let's confess together now the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue at this time with our hymn of the day. That's hymn number 778. You can find that on the back cover of your service folder.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, maybe I'm dreaming at this time of year. I've been known to do that. Maybe I just see what I want to see. But when I'm watching TV, we have cable, and looking through, scanning through the cable channels, the options that I have, I tend to think, again, maybe I'm dreaming, that there tends to be more fishing shows at this time of year than at other times of year. My theory is this, if that's true. My theory is, is it's this time of year that guys like myself, maybe you don't know, I like to go fishing. I'm not all that good at it, but I like to do it. And I'm not an ice fisherman. I'm past that stage of sitting on a five-gallon bucket on a big ice cube. I don't do that anymore. But I do like to fish. And to do that kind of fishing that I like to do, it's nice when it's warm. And so I give a little extra attention to those shows that I come across once in a while. You see these guys on those big fancy boats. And it doesn't have to be a fancy boat, but a nice, beautiful lake, maybe up in Canada, somewhere north, of just the trees all around up there. You say, ah, man, they're having fun. They're catching 48-inch muskies. Man, they're catching big, smallmouth bass. They're catching 28-inch walleyes. Ah, oh, Wow, I can't wait to go fishing. It's too cold to go fishing now, but maybe I'll go to Cabela's. Maybe I'll buy some of that new gear they're using. There are all kinds of fancy lures. Oh, gets my blood going a little bit to see all that kinds of fishing, which then makes me think I've had a few good fishing trips myself. Maybe the fishing hasn't been so great, that trip, but you've got good friends along. You've got beautiful scenery, beautiful country up in Canada, beautiful country. In, in northern Wisconsin, beautiful country. I haven't been to Lewis and Clark yet, but hopefully, hopefully we'll get up there, have a good fishing trip or two. But in the big picture, you know, you think about fishing trips like that, and say, really, in the big picture, they're not all that important. It's not like I go fishing in order to provide food for the table of my family. It's not that important. You think about the length of these fishing trips. They're not all that long. A few days, a week, two weeks? I don't know. But when we think about a fishing trip, when we think about a command, when we think about a direction that our Savior Jesus gives us in our text, he refers to a job, a responsibility, a fishing trip on which each and every one of us is on right at this moment. That we look at the importance of sharing the message of Jesus Christ. We look at the importance of sharing our faith to those around us who don't know who this Jesus Christ is and what he did for the forgiveness of sins. It reminds us of our, my own responsibility on the fishing trip of a lifetime. That we look at these truths in our text here in Luke chapter 5 and remind ourselves of the importance of this fishing trip of a lifetime. And we'll see two things. That first of all, on this fishing trip of a lifetime on which we all are, Jesus, our Savior, gives some very unconventional instructions. But then we'll also see when we faithfully follow those unconventional instructions of our Savior Jesus, there will be, there will be staggering results. Would you follow along as we go through our text this morning, reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. It's on the bottom of page 7 of your service folder. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the lake of Gennesaret is the Sea of Galilee, same thing, by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, 
Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. It's our text. This text is taking place chronologically very, very early in Jesus' ministry. If you think back to the past weeks that we've had here at St. Paul's, the readings and such that we've had point to these, this early ministry of Jesus, the epiphany season when we see Jesus being baptized by John in the Jordan River. We we'll remember that Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days fasting and was tempted by Satan. And it really is kind of a surprise. This is before Jesus doing ministry, before he had his group of disciples picked out, those 12 guys that we're very familiar with, that our text here, Luke chapter 5, Jesus didn't have any of those disciples yet. Yet he was going around Galilee, going around Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, preaching and teaching, and he had quite a following. Might surprise us. But you look at Luke chapter 4, just the chapter before our text, and we very clearly see that Jesus' presence, his preaching and teaching, was having an incredible effect on the people. We read in Luke chapter 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Or just a few verses later, and just a few verses later, it's still in Luke chapter 4, talking about Jesus' early ministry before he had those disciples. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. Again, before we could really say Jesus started his hardcore ministry with those 12 disciples preaching and teaching to the people, yet yeah, it was obviously having an effect. And you can say it was having an effect because the message of Jesus' teaching was very unconventional. Up until this point, for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, the people, the Jews, had been hearing a message taught by the teachers of the law, the Jewish religious teachers, that really was not different than what so many people hear today, that so many people have heard throughout history. Ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, hasn't it been a tempting thing for religion, for individuals, to follow the logic, the conventional way of thinking, in order to reach an eternal life, in order to please a God? that that conventional way of thinking is just exactly what the teachers of the law in the Old Testament were teaching to these people around Jesus. you got to follow that Mosaic law. you got to earn that. you got to please God by doing this or doing that. It all depends on you and what you do in order to please that righteous, holy God. And isn't that the most conventional way of thinking that our sinful human logic can ever come up with. That it doesn't it apply to everything in life. Conventionally speaking, conventionally thinking says, if I want something, I got to do something to get it. If I want a new fishing boat, what do I got to do? I got to save some money. I got to look for good deals. I got to do something to get that new fishing boat. If I want to reach eternal life in heaven, what do I got to do? My conventional Human logic says i got to do something to earn it, to get it. And this is where that unconventional wisdom, the unconventional truths of God's holy word plays in, that fights against anything of our human logic, our sinful human logic, that we just before confessed our faith and what that unconventional truths of the triune God does for us. Father creates me, Son redeems me, Holy Spirit sanctifies me. There's nothing in those creeds, nothing in the truths of God's holy word that says I have anything to do with my own salvation, which gets to this incredibly wonderful, comforting truth of God the Holy Spirit and this unconventional truth of how it is that you and I can sit here in the peace and security 
knowing that our sins are forgiven, that it's God the Holy Spirit who has created that saving faith in our hearts so that we can hear this message of the gospel and be comforted. It's completely illogical. It's completely unconventional. And isn't it true that those unconventional instructions that are given by Jesus Christ, here's how your sins are forgiven. Isn't it true that those unconventional truths really lead us to do unconventional things as we follow through, as we live our Christian lives in complete contrast to the way an unbelieving world and an unbelieving culture around us lives? That that unbelievable, unconventional message of, of G- our Savior Jesus really makes us do some crazy things, at least crazy in the eyes of the world around us. And we see that faith. Really, isn't that why we do that? through that word called faith, that the Holy Spirit has created faith, now we follow that unconventional message. And we see it in our text. Jesus, remember, he was a carpenter. Nazareth, there was no water around Nazareth. Jesus didn't know anything about fishing, really. He comes to the Sea of Galilee and tells these three hardcore, salty veteran fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, Peter, James, John... You guys got it all wrong. You're doing, you're doing your fishing last night all wrong. Here's what you got to do. Unconventional instructions in how to catch fish. Go out in the middle of the day, deep water of the Sea of Galilee, throw out your nets, and then you'll catch some fish. Do you see how Simon Peter responded? Did he fire back at Jesus and say, What in the world are you talking about, Mr. Nazareth guy who has no water to fish in, Mr. Hammer and Nails guy, not a fishing pole guy. What are you talking about? Instructions for catching and fish. Look at verse 5 of our text. Simon says, Master, we've worked hard all night. Do you know what's the very first word? Does he call Jesus a Yahoo? Does he call Jesus, what do you know, ignorant? You don't know how to fish. He calls him with a very respectful title master obviously this this reputation of jesus and the power of jesus teaching has gotten to peter too peter rightly calling him master son of god master we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything but because you say so we will let down our nets as unconventional as those instructions are through faith through this trust that Peter, James, and John also have, because you say so, dear Lord, we'll do this. Doesn't that also affect each and every one of us in a spiritual sense? We certainly see all kinds of physical results that God has said, because you are faithful, when you are faithful, when you follow my commands, don't we have the promise of having staggering results, of being blessed by God? Don't we see the staggering results of Peter, James, and John following the unconventional instruction of Jesus to go fishing? So many fish. And these weren't little shallow draft John boats out out on the lake. These were big boats. Big boats that were so full of fish that were sinking. Staggering physical results by following Jesus' unconventional command. Now, you and I may not be fishing. Our boats may not be sinking because we have so many fish. But aren't there staggering results of the faithfulness, staggering blessings that our good Lord gives to us as we live our faithful lives to his commands? I have to admit, I forget about, I, I overlook these staggering results, these staggering blessings, physical blessings that our God gives to me in my life our lives. You think about how staggering it is to have the blessing of Christian family. You ever think about that? The staggering blessing of having Christian parents, blessing of Christian kids, grandkids, aunts, uncles. It doesn't say Christian families don't have the consequences of sin in their lives and and dealing with sin and trials and challenges. Not at all. 
But it is staggering when you're dealing with the consequences of sin and the blessings to say we can communi- communicate as Christians. We're going to deal with these situations as selfless Christians. It's staggering blessing. Christian family. Same thing with Christian friends. How about the staggering blessing of stuff? Didn't God bless the fishermen with stuff? All kinds of fish? I've learned to use and appreciate the word contentment more. Isn't that a staggering blessing to have Christian contentment? The world around us would follow the conventional way of thinking that says you've got to have a lot of stuff. You've got to have the newest boat. You've got to have tackle boxes full of stuff. You've got to have all this stuff in order to be happy. Happy. Define happy. Rather to say the staggering blessing of Christian contentment that says, ah, the stuff I have, the stuff the good Lord has given me is good enough. I'm content. I don't need any more. The daily bread that I have, Christian contentment, it's staggering. And dear friends, those are only physical blessings, right? Christian family. And just a few physical blessings. Christian family. Christian contentment. Because when we start talking about contentment, Doesn't that remind us of peace, security, joy? And this is where that spiritual, those truths, when we join with Peter and say, Ah, Master, Savior, Son of God, you're the Savior of the world. You're my Savior from sin. When we're talking about the staggering results of following Jesus' unconventional instructions, boy, we're talking about the forgiveness of our sins. We're talking about the peace and security knowing that I have a spot waiting for me in heaven, not because of what I've done, not because of my so-called wisdom, but because of the self-sacrifice of our Savior Jesus, because of what he has done for me and you and all the sinners in this world, which gets us to this whole responsibility that we have, right? To be fishers of men, fishers of people to be looking for those opportunities in our daily lives and not just put it on the pastors, not just put it on an evangelism committee, not just to put it on those missionaries who go and do missionary things, but to look for those opportunities of throwing that bait out, throwing that lure, throwing that net out of the gospel and saying this is the way that sins are forgiven. This is the way to eternal life. I guess I look at it like this. That I could, on a fishing trip, have the fanciest boat that I could ever imagine. And on that fancy boat, I could have the latest electronics. I could have all this sonar stuff. I could see all the rocks and the trees down there on the bottom. I could see right where the fish are. That's where they are, right on that rock pile. And I could have all the fanciest rods and reels in that boat. And then I could go down to my tackle box and have the shiniest spoons and the most colorful plugs and all these spinners. Oh, man, I could have all that stuff. Then I could have a, a, a minnow bucket full of big, fat, lively minnows just ready to go. In my bait bucket, I could have some big, thick, fat, juicy night crawlers. Oh, I could have all the things I need to go fishing. But if I don't put a lure on the end of a line, if I don't put one of those big, fat, juicy night crawlers on a hook and throw it out into the water, what good is it? That's the picture, dear friends, that we have. We have the Word of God. We have this gift of the truth of Jesus Christ, better than any fancy tackle box, better than any fancy hook and line. Dear friends, Let's be ready to throw that bait out, that lure, so to speak, of the truth of God's word. We're not going to catch a fish every time, right? Just because I have a fancy lure and throw it out doesn't mean I'm going to catch a fish every time. But when I do, boy, isn't it fun. When I throw out that bait of God's word and when I am used by God, the Holy Spirit, it's a humbling, wonderful thing. Wonderful thing that makes me want to keep on casting and casting and casting some more with that truth of God's holy word. Dear friends, you and I, we are fishers, fishers of men. On the fishing trip of a lifetime, a lifetime of service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's always remember 
that on this fishing trip of a lifetime, it's really, what's the purpose? It's the fishing trip for, right? A for a lifetime, a lifetime in heaven. Our Savior Jesus, the master fisherman Jesus, certainly gives some unconventional instructions. But when we follow those unconventional instructions, he promises some staggering results, eternal life in heaven. Amen. Would you please stand? Now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in faith through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Let's gather our thank offerings at this time. congregation may remain seated. I'd ask our newly elected church officers and board members to please come forward. Dear friends in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. You have now been selected for positions of service to our Lord on behalf of this congregation. The Lord has entrusted you with an office which you are to carry out as his servants and according to his word. St. Paul wrote concerning service in the church, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, 
let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. The Lord seeks faithfulness from all who serve. As scripture says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The Lord does not seek from us what he has not given to us. But when he does give a gift, his will is that we use it faithfully to his glory and for the benefit of his people. You are also, as servants of Jesus Christ and workers in this congregation, to set for your own families and for the whole church the example of Christian lives. Make the word of God your foundation and guide. Search it daily for comfort and instruction. So that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God in this congregation, will you diligently and faithfully carry out the office entrusted to you according to the ability which God gives you? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I now install you as congregational officers and board members of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Miles Spreeman, Daniel Pufal, Ron Kramer, John Koba, Kurt Dinkel, John Eaker, Gary Jackson, Joel Wiedemann, Joe Myers, Gary Brett Schneider. May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to his glory and for the good of his people. Then I'd ask the congregation to please stand. Members of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, I urge you to regard these fellow believers as servants of Jesus Christ and God's gifts to his church. Pray for them, support them in their service, and help them so that through the gospel ministry of this congregation, more people will be reached for Christ and his kingdom. And let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, our lives are open before you and you hear our promises. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit into the hearts of your servants, that they may carry out their duties with diligence, boldness, and wisdom. Give them a spirit of devotion and prayer, that in every time of need they may present their requests to you. Help them be examples of what is good, that by their lives they may build up your congregation and give the enemies of the church no cause for complaint. Make them a blessing to your believers. Help them to work with their pastors and with one another and grant that by their service the unity of this congregation be strengthened, your name be hallowed, your kingdom be enlarged, and your will be done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Go then and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. You may go in peace and return to your seats. Let's continue then with the prayer of the church and the Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church who provides workers in your harvest field. We thank you for winning salvation for your people, and we praise you for delivering that salvation to us through your means of grace, your gospel in word and sacraments. Give us all an appreciation for those gifts of grace. Give us a spirit of love and support for all who serve in your name, and work in us a godly boldness so that all our words and lives may give you glory and testify to what you have done for us. Forgive us when we are timid and help us to encourage one another so that more and more people can come to know you, your gospel, and your eternal salvation. And Lord, please also be with all those among our congregation, family, and friends who are struggling with their health or working through personal difficulties. We especially entrust to your care Katie Brown, who is still recovering from injury and surgery after a fall, as well as Dick Tejan whose time in this world seems to be drawing to a close. If it is your will, 
Please give them all quick comfort, healing, and recovery. But in all things, focus their eyes of faith on you so that they can see your good purposes in this life and look forward to their perfect life eternal. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We pray all these things in your name, trusting that you will hear and answer us. And we also join in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Let's continue now with the Song of Simeon that's found on page 11 in your service folder. give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Let us pray. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for the closing hymn. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. <laughs> 